So now that we know what a kernel is and we know what a Hilbert space is, let's officially define reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And I know I gave you a little definition earlier, but this one's not quite the same. Okay, so we need to do four things. First, we need to define a feature map, phi. That feature map is going to tell us what are the elements of our Hilbert space. From those elements, we're going to define what it means to do an inner product on them. And then we'll show that k is the special function that we need for the reproducing property. And then we have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, so here's our feature map. It takes x and then evaluates uh, k just at one of the arguments, okay, at x, and it leaves the other one waiting for another argument, okay? So again, I like to think about, um, I like to think about, I mean, case, you, you could choose whatever kernel you want, but I like to think about it as like, you know, mapping a point to a function that is centered at that point. Okay, that's just my general way of thinking about things so that there's room for another argument. Uh, and when you put that argument in, it simply evaluates the kernel at now both arguments. Okay, so you get a number back. Cool. Okay, so now from here, we are going to construct the vectors for our vector space, and they're going to be uh, linear combinations of the kernels uh, half evaluated at these different xi's. And you can choose whichever xi's you want, and you can have as many of them, as many terms as you want. So m here, that sum, over, uh, that sum from i equals 1 to m, you, you can have m be whatever you want, and you can pick xi's to be whatever you want. Okay, so those are elements of our vector space, and we're going, those are our fundamental objects that we're going to work with to define our space. Okay, so the vector space is this is going to be the span of these of functions like this. Okay, no surprise. And we have um, addition and multiplication for this. It's well defined, so it's a vector space, and that's okay. Um, so now we have to define the inner product, and uh, the I'm going to define the inner product, and then we'll check that it's actually an inner product. Okay, valid inner product. Okay, so this is how we'll define it. So you have x, you have g. And then that's what you do to get the inner product between f and g, okay? You take the two sums at the outside, multiply the coefficients together, and then the, the kernels get, get evaluated that way. All right. So now, is it, an inner, is it a valid inner product? Okay, so I have to check the three conditions, um, symmetric, bilinear, and positive, uh, positive definiteness, okay? So... Let's do that. So symmetry is the easiest one, and that's easy because the kernel, um, the way we defined it, it's symmetric and it gives rise to positive semi-definite gram matrices. So anyway, so it's symmetric. Um, I can just swap the uh, the alphas and the betas. I can swap the sums, and I can swap the entries in K, and I get exactly the, the symmetric um, version. Okay, it is bilinear. Um, you, you have to do a little work to check that. Let's let's do this, okay? So I'm just gonna simplify things a little bit and I'm gonna bring the sum over i in one. I, I'm allowed to do that, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, but when I do, I notice immediately that uh, the quantity in that, the, the, the sort of inner sum there, that uh, by definition of f, that is f evaluated at the point xj prime. Okay, the, just by the definition of, up at the up at the top of the slide there, that's that's the using the definition of x. Okay, so this um, this I'm going to use this uh, several times to prove to help me prove the bilinearity, and so I've just written it nice and neatly over here on the um, actually just right below there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we go <laughs> to prove the uh, bilinearity. Okay, so remember I need to prove that um, if I take f1 and f2 inside the inner product that it separates out and that it's going to be the inner product of f1 with g plus the inner product of f2 with g. Okay, um, so now all I did at this first line there in that equality was I applied this equation star. Okay, so where I had f in this star, now I have f1 plus f2. So that's the only, like, literally just take take equation star and replace f with f1 plus f2. Okay, great. So then, um, then I can pull the sum in. And once I pull that sum in, now I can use equation star again, but in reverse to get back to 
the two separate inner products. And now I have my bilinearity, at least from the left. And now I'm supposed to, um, I'm supposed to do it the same thing for the other side, but the calculation is essentially identical. And so hopefully you believe me. Cool. So now for the hard part, we have to prove that it's strictly positive definite. And I can fairly easily get to positive semi-definite. So let's do that. Um, so I wanna take, right, I'm, I'm supposed to prove that if you take the inner product of F with itself, um, that that thing, that that thing is it's, um, uh, uh, greater than or equal to zero and it's zero only when F is zero. Okay, so the greater than or equal to zero part, that's the bit I can do with the fact that the gram matrix is always positive semi-definite just by the definition of our kernel. So let me show that. Okay, so I'm just gonna rewrite this as um, this, you know, uh, it's a vector times a matrix times another vector. And this is exactly in the form that I can use to prove, that I can use to leverage my positive semi-definiteness. Okay, so because K is a valid kernel, then this matrix K, the gram matrix for just these points uh, for just the points one through M, um, that gram matrix is positive semi-definite because that's the way we defined a kernel. We defined it so that it gives rise to positive semi-definite gram matrices. So that thing is greater than or equal to zero, no matter what the alphas are, because of this positive semi-definiteness. So at least we at least we have that part. So we have that that you know the inner product of f with itself is always Non-negative. Okay, good. So <laughs> that's part of the story. Um, and now we're still left to show that if that inner product is zero, then f is exactly zero for all x, uh, which we haven't done. Um, but before I do it, I'm gonna take a short interlude to talk about the reproducing property and then I'll get back to proving positive definiteness. Okay, so I'm gonna take the inner product of f with just one of the k's. Okay, so I'm going to define all the betas to be zero except for one beta, which is one. And so instead of G, I just get K evaluated at X. Okay, so send that through the definition of the inner product that I have above. And what I end up with is that, which as you probably recognize by now, this is just F evaluated at X. Okay, so this is an evaluation functional. I took the inner product of k at x with f, and I got f of x. So that's exactly the evaluation, you know, that, that it, it's evaluating f at x. So the, the kernel there, k, is actually exhibiting exactly the reproducing property. Good, so now hopefully you can believe that k is a reproducing kernel. Now, the next cool thing is that if you take the inner product of k at x, k centered at x, and k centered at x prime, what you get actually is k of x and x prime. Uh, so that's that's really neat. Um, so hopefully you understand kind of how, how cool these properties are. These are actually both um, useful equations that we end up using every time we use reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces because these are the fundamental equations that allow us to say that this is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, so this is a reproducing kernel and um, this is the reproducing property that defines the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, so F is reproducing the value, or, sorry, K is reproducing the value of F at X in that first uh, expression there. Okay, so let's go back to the question of whether, um, whether it's as well defined. Now, um, we still are missing this last fact that if the norm, uh, sorry, if the inner product of f with itself is zero, then f has to be zero for all x. Okay, we haven't shown that. And um, so we're gonna do it. This one's trickier. So we're, we'll start with uh, the, this, F, f at some point x squared, right? We're gonna show this is true for all x, that this thing is zero, if that inner product is zero. Okay, we're gonna use the reproducing property first, and uh, the, there it is in reverse. That's fine. Um, and then this part is confusing. We're gonna use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We haven't proven it. Uh, we only proved it for kernel functions, but we didn't prove it for functions from the space. 
And I don't like using something we haven't proved, but if it's not true, we're dead, right? This is not an inner product space. Um, so we must have it. And if it is true, uh, then, you know, it's, then we can, we can actually use it to get this expression here. And then from there, we can use that this, the norm uh, is, we can use our assumption that, that, that the inner product of f with itself is, is zero. Oh, sorry, for, forgot. We have to use the reproducing property first. Okay, use the reproducing property first, and then um, the assumption that that uh, inner product there is zero. Okay, and I was thinking about this, and I was wondering whether having this last property kind of contradicts with the fact that um, the assumption that the gram matrix is positive semi-definite rather than um, positive definite. Um, like, I was wondering how it's possible that the norm of f is zero without all of the alphas defining f to be zero. And I think it is possible, but it's a really weird trivial situation where some of the kernel functions are like equal and opposite each other. And, uh, you know, so that they cancel each other out when they get added together. And then some of the rows of the gram matrix negate each other. In any case, we shouldn't worry about any of that because um, in reality, we're, you know, the cases we're going to consider, none of that actually happens, or at least we don't need to know about it. Um, in any case, we've proven our last piece, and now we can say that the inner product is well-defined. Okay, so completeness is easy, um, right? A Hilbert space is a complete inner product space, so we have to have it be complete. Um, but uh, all you have to do is just define the space that includes that it includes all the limit points. So we just define a norm just like that right up there. Uh, and then um, just uh, define the space so that it includes the, um, the limits of all sequences in that norm. And that's what, that's what this line here, that's the big line right there. That's what that means. Okay, so that was easy. And again, just to remind you, right, elements of the space um, consist of, uh, of these, these uh, sums, of <laughs> sums of the kernels centered at any points you like. It's cool. Arbitrary, num arbitrary sums of any number of them. Uh, kernels centered, weighted kernels centered at any point you, you want. Okay, and so now we have our reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And it's a space that, where you have this kernel, it has the reproducing property, and it spans uh, space. Cool. So um, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space I described is from the moore aronstein theorem that states that for every positive kernel function, there exists a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And so, of course, the proof is by construction. You take k, you construct phi from it, like I did at the very beginning of this video, and then you form that reproducing kernel Hilbert space and you prove that that k is actually a valid kernel. Uh, that, cur that it's actually a, well, you already knew it was a valid kernel. You're proving that it, it has the reproducing property for the space. Okay, and I should mention that there is another way to construct a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that's closer to what we did in the, fi in the case where we were working in, the, in finite uh, state space. Uh, and it's based on Mercer's theorem. So instead of what we just did, uh, showing you how to construct the functions from the space and then the inner product and so on, um, Mercer's theorem takes the same approach that we did earlier in the finite case where we took um, the gram matrix and then decomposed it into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So Mercer's theorem decomposes uh, operator, it decomposes um, the space into eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. Um, and so you get um, you get actually the same the same sort of mm, it's the same sort of uh, idea in the end that we did in the finite case. Okay, so I wanted to just put those two expressions up there so that you kind of keep them in your mind because again they get used all the time. All right, thank you.